When we rebuild, we rebuild stronger by learning what took us down and putting in tools, mortar, brick, whatever it is that made us more resilient for the next storm so that we can stand in all our glory and all our beauty and weather the storm. But I thought about if we just embrace that in our bodies, right? Like, how do we build back stronger? You know, yeah. Because there's going to be a storm and a next storm and a next storm. So you guys, my goal for doing this podcast is to bring people into our worlds, right? That can help us learn, share our stories, relate with one another. And so today I'm really excited about who we're going to spend time with. It's Sheila Andreen. And she is going to, you know, she's an impactful storyteller. She is the CEO and founder of Impactful and co-founder of Indie Flicks, which is an award-winning um, filmmaking organization. She's Emmy-nominated costume designer, author, founder of the Impactful Fund. She's going to tell us all about that, impactfulfund.org. But in talking with her, her life mission or things that she is just so heavily involved in, and I can't wait for you to hear her story, is a, th a lot of things that we're dealing with, a lot of things that we relate to. First of all, she's got six kids, guys. She's a caregiver in her family. She's the CMO, like we talk about all the time, the chief medical officer of your tribe, right? Um, so without further ado, and, and again, Sheila, thank you so much for being here today. I cannot wait to share some of what you're doing with, with the community. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I love being able to share. And and you're just a storyteller. I mean, we were talking before we started about, you know, kind of your life and individually that, that impact you. Um, but right now you have this uh, initiative or Health 101. Can you tell me, tell us all a little bit about it. It's like kind of get us up to speed. I've been reading and and studying, right, for us to, to kind of have this time together. But how, how can you share with our community what that's all about? Yeah. I think just to set the table a little bit, we'll go, I'm going to just like rewind just yeah. a bit because Health 101 is on the horizon to to come out. It's what I'm working on currently. And I'm building upon a foundation that I started, uh, oh gosh, almost 10 years ago, um, but really seven years, eight years ago, it, it, it just blossomed into something major with regard to mental health. Um, I got involved early on with a small film called Finding Kind, which was about bullying in girl world, which then led me to create with an incredible director, uh, Empowerment Project, which was all about just empowering women and, and finding role models within our own communities instead of, you know, on the cover of a magazine. And then Screenagers, which was about, you know, how old should your kid be when they get a phone? I mean, that conversation has definitely changed. Um, and and then a friend of mine who ran our foundation, Impactful Fund, um, who was a childhood friend, kept saying, you need to make a movie about mental health. And I kept saying, uh, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't know anything about it. I'm a college dropout. I'm a filmmaker. I wouldn't even know where to start to make a movie about mental health. And frankly, I don't think that anybody would want to watch a movie about mental health at school or at work. And, and I was taking these films, which had blossomed into programs with not just discussion guides and marketing materials, but then like classroom discussion guides, team building activities at corporations. And it had really just blossomed into more based on demand from these communities. And so I got a call on January 1st, um, early in the morning from a dear friend who had told me about my friend Tina who had died by suicide. Oh. And, um, and she was our executive director of our foundation. And I just thought, oh my gosh, I knew she was struggling, but I didn't know it was that bad. Right. So I'm going to make a movie about mental health and I don't even know anything about it. I personally was living the stigma. I mean, even when I decided to make a movie about mental health and I told my family, they were like, why don't you make a movie about diabetes or heart disease? Like why mental health? Right. And, you know, coming from the films, the film world, I always thought it was shock treatment and straitjacket. It was cuckoo's nest, right? It wasn't, I didn't understand anything about mental health. Right. So dove in, decided I needed to figure out how to approach this conversation in a way that would be universal. So I picked anxiety because everyone has anxiety and anxiety is actually really good for you. It's what keeps us alive and aware and, you know, effective in so many ways. 
but it's gotten to a point where it is too much and it's becoming paralyzing and debilitating. So I entered the conversation that way. We filmed so many people. I worked with some other amazing filmmakers and we made angst. Nobody licensed it into community for six months. They were all afraid if we opened up this conversation, we didn't have the ability to support it. We didn't even know what to do. And at first, I'm sorry for the loss of your friend. And, and, you know, we work in the space of a lot of individuals that deal with chronic disease, chronic illness. Maybe they've been medically gaslit. They don't feel heard. They, they've lost hope. Our, our, our whole purpose, right, is to continue to throw these lifelines of hope in, in your health and in your health wellness and also believe people 100 percent for yes. what they're going through and that they are the ones that understand as confused or as hard of the situation that they're currently in right now. They are the ones that understand more about what's going on. And so we need to listen in, in, in intimately. In in the anxiety aspect of things, even in, in the field of the immune system and neuroimmunology, right? It's it's how our bodies adapt to the environment around us. And I think the other day someone said to me that, you know, do people have more anxiety or are people talking about anxiety more? I think it's both. I, I There's no way you're going to convince me that people aren't feeling more anxiety internally. Um, we're able to measure certain things a little bit now neurochemically, yeah. right? So that people, we don't just tell somebody like, hey, it's in your head, you know, which, okay, maybe it is mast cell activation and I'm having an environmental toxicity response and I'm sending out all these histamine bombs and my fight flight hormones are, you know, high for a reason. It's not just, you know, calm down, take take a couple deep breaths. But but why do you think it wasn't received? Do you think it's an uncomfortable conversation? Because we because it's real, right? Well, I definitely think it's uncomfortable. I think it's still uncomfortable. In fact, it's interesting there was a New York Times article that came out recently that says we're talking about it more than ever and it's worse than ever. Kids are dying. The biggest thing I think was fear. There was no denying that there was a problem. Kids okay. were dying by suicide. Right. People were struggling on a massive scale. And this was before COVID. Right. So schools just weren't prepared, neither were corporations, to show something like this, have this conversation. And they weren't quite sure how to support you know, it when it was so opened up. Is it like the elephant in the room? Like it's better yeah. I'll pretend like it doesn't exist? Yeah, I guess it's great. And, and, and do you think it's because we're not sure what to do about it? Or, yeah. Or, okay. So, so I mean, I, go ahead, please. No, I just think that that's something that's really common. I mean, I have six kids. I'm so well-versed in all of this now, right? Having been working on it for so many years. But when my own kid has an issue, like a panic attack or or some, they start spiraling or something, like I can often become a deer on the headlights. Like, and I know I have my tools. Like I know what I should be doing. But I panic and it doesn't help the situation and I need to learn how to check myself. Like, but it's a practice. Hi, it's Haley, your host. I know firsthand what it feels like to find real impactful solutions to your struggles. And I know what it feels like to lose hope. We are being bombarded by toxins every single day. As a matter of fact, the world's largest single environmental health risk is air pollution. One thing that is becoming crystal clear is that environmental toxic burdens in our bodies must be addressed. Let me help you tackle toxic burden. Go to HaleyPomeroy.com forward slash detox and download my free detox decoded masterclass. Let's give you a fighting chance. I know what it feels like to lose hope, whether you're dealing with fatigue, mast cell activation, an autoimmune disorder, long COVID, viral reactivation, anxiety or depression, or inflammation. All of it can feel overwhelming. I will teach you nutrition and natural therapies to help your body eliminate toxins. I cannot wait to see you there. Again, that's HaleyPomeroy.com forward slash detox. But it's interesting because I was just in Slovenia. I was I was at the International Congress for Autoimmune Disorders, and um, we were working with everything from you know immunologists, neurologists, nephrologists, virologists, people in in complex disease study, 
Um, and and someone said something, you know, and, and again, from St. Petersburg, from Israel, from the U.S., from Stanford, you know, you name it. It was this massive group of about 1,200 people coming together to talk about it. And that there, that there's such a neurochemical physiological response. And, and we were talking in the autoimmune space about fear of the flare, right? About the anxiety around, is my health, where, when's the other shoe going to drop? Is my health going to take a negative turn? Is that secondhand smoke or the food that I, the gluten that I just consumed, is that going to be the thing that kind of pushes me over? And I think that for so long with anxiety, people said, you know, just toughen up, toughen it out or apply, you know, a, a tool as opposed to supporting the body so that it has capacity to adapt to these stressors. Like I'm all for like, let's infuse the body so it's more resilient to the stressors that are exposed, that they're exposed upon or exposed to. Yeah. Yeah. And are people, are people starting to have those kinds of conversations? Like it's like, I don't know. We have a lot of type A individuals, a lot of really successful individuals that walk through the clinic that get diagnosed with ME-CFS, myelogic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, right? There is a component to anxiety, to hormone dysregulation, dysautonomia, and 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 their doctors aren't even talking to them about it. They're like, yeah, life is stressful. It's so interesting because in the schools in particular, which are now being very controlled by legislature, local, you know, state legislation. And, you know, and depending on the state, and, and parents are very good at, good at really getting involved in what is allowed to be taught in a school. Right. And, you know, that's our future, right? That generation that we're educating now. And you need the whole community to be, to be part of it. I think that you have a lot of different schools of thought and those schools of thought are rooted in very deep sort of origin stories, right? Um, there's a lot of people who think that we're, you know, creating a bunch of wussies in in our children because we're talking about our feelings too much and we're putting, we're projecting mental health issues. And so therefore we could, it, be, it could spread right, like a cold. We have people like, I mean, I can't go into all the different ones, but there's all these different schools of thought. What's interesting is that the, like the, to, to just call it out, and I think everyone can say it, the red states, the conservative states, are a little more pull yourself up by your bootstraps. We know that there's an issue, but, you know, like, let's not get too into all of that. Let's focus on academics. Let's understand that there's some things happening here. In the bluer states or more progressive states, it's much more like, oh, my God, we got to lean into social emotional learning. We have to, like, really understand, like, how food affects mental health, how exercise, sleep, nutrition, um, mindfulness, human sexuality education, like how we identify, like all of that. So learning from all the but, things. But it's so sad to see anything even politicized, right? Because oh yeah, because we peel everything away. I mean, I mean, I hear what you're saying and I know that it's so important. When I was in at George Washington um, in the public health space at GW, like it's it's great for us to be I, to identify trends and trajectories because, you know, then we know where to invest to make an impact. From yeah. a public from a public health perspective, but but some of the basics, and I, I love the one hundred and one concept of this future initiative. Some of the basic things about you know we all eat, we all breathe, we all drink, is is such a unifying universal opportunity yeah. for us, in my opinion. Right when when you take when you take some of the the nuanced right, and I I, mean, I decided. Even with my soil science ag background, I decided to jump into the diet space because I was so irritated that yeah. that people would even talk about nutrition and fasting in the same sentence, right? Or or not eating as an option. Try doing it to a zoo animal, you'll lose your license. Try doing it to the ASPCA, you'll lose you'll you'll get in trouble. Try doing it to your dog or your cat. But yet, as as humans, you know, we're expected so much of ourselves, and we and we somehow went less. So I I kind of feel like. There's things that can unify people, and I think that that mental health and and just the even not segmenting mental health and integrating mental health as a basic health principle, yep. right? Just like we we don't we stitch ourselves up if we get a gaping wound, right? We we repair a fracture with with swift, you know, medical intervention. We have, yeah. we, have, we have ambulances, you know, that scrape us off the ground, me included, after a car accident. 
Mm. I, I think that my opinion is that if we can normalize mental health and normalize our body's communication mode of communication and how sophisticated we're getting and listening to that, that it can unify people. Like I, I, I do, I, I like again in epidemiology and being in, in the public health space, um, it is interesting to see to see those trends. We are trying to like, and, and this is, I was reading a lot of your stuff and so many people that feel hopeless in their health, right? The individual, the dear friend that you lost, I've I've lost two friends to suicide. And I I just, I always think to myself, like, you know, what could I have dif- done different? How could I be a different friend? How could I be differently involved in this person's life? That's a little, I, I try to not struggle from an ego perspective, like I could have fixed something, but right. could I have been more, more supportive? But then we look at our hundreds of thousands of people in our community and I think sometimes giving some of those real life solutions that don't necessarily feel overwhelming and daunting. I was just teaching a course. We had our coaches come out to my ranch, which is part of my medicine, right, if for myself. And one of the things that I was talking about is people that have adrenal fatigue or they're having anxiety is don't give them a to-do list. Look at what they're doing and see what you can take off of their plate and mm-hmm. see what you can infuse them with. So, you know, what's the shortest space between getting some relief, you know, so the solution to relief and administering the relief, we, how can you shorten the gap? That's like your number one goal with clients that walk in with anxiety. What do you tell people or, or what stories do you feel have been the most impactful about people getting some relief from the anxiety that they're feeling? Well, I think we're slightly um, a little more in. I think what we're learning is the the films and there's in the so we have a program called the Creative Coping Toolkit and that's where all the film programs live. Mm. So that's where Angst lives, which is the one I was telling you about. That was the first one that kind of launched me into the mental health space. And then from Angst, it came up. Why is anxiety on the rise? And that's where we made like to understand the role of social media and technology, right. and then. Why are people so mean online when they wouldn't be that way in person? And that's where the upstanders came in. And then the last one is race to be human, which is like, how does belonging and othering affect our mental health and our lives? Um, and so that was race to be human. So so how do they get the toolkit? How, and, 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 and is this like a link where everybody can download the movies? Like how does so this work? For right now, it's, um, and has been for many years, is it's licensed into community at sort of oftentimes the district level or even the state of California, it's at the state level. So it's available to every K through 12 public school and charter school in the state of California, one of our programs within the toolkit. Um, Washington State, Illinois, and Alaska had all four programs. Actually, Illinois had only angst and the other two states had the whole program. And so you can go to impactful. actually to our foundation, which is impactfulfund.org. And you can access it there. Now, it, you know, as we're raising money to keep it free into these schools, or we license it directly to the schools and corporations around the world, honestly. Um, I am on a mission with our foundation to make it free across the country in every classroom. That'd but it, it's a big haul. So <laughs> I'm not good But I to get back to your earlier question as far as like this the biggest feedback we get from when anyone watches it is grownups say, where was this program when I was younger? I might not have self-medicated so much or been in such a self-destruct mode to bury, not address, that kind of thing. Young people say, I need my dad to see this. I've had eight-year-old kids see it and be able to point to a particular character in the movies because it's all stories. And most of it is children talking. And they're so vulnerable and pure and raw and unedited that they just speak this pureness that everyone can relate to. We're going into assisted living environments where they think it's better for, you know, the the residents to be able to connect more with their children or grandchildren when in fact they're connecting the dots for themselves about why their mom never left her, the house or and how they the generational component. I mean, think of how much of our lives is generationally Influence. Impacted. Absolutely. Money, food, superstition. I mean, all of it. So including mental health. 
And then there's the genetics piece, not just the, you know, the, the learning component, but the actual DNA. And so that's kind of where we've really found an impact is introducing the conversation and looking at it through a particular lens of just honest, pure, unedited and unfiltered. And people just start talking and everyone is wired differently, right? Yes, absolutely. So then what works for you? Just like a, there's a million diets out there. And some people will be like, oh, Sheila, you should be on this diet. I'm like, well, I'm allergic to nuts. And it's like 80% nuts, it feels like. Right. So that's not going to work for me. Or, you know, like when all my kids went off to college, they all became vegan or, you know, that kind of thing. So holidays were challenging, right? Making a million different meals for everybody. To answer your question, mostly it's um, learning how to address everyone's individual needs and then for the fam- from the family level and then the community level. And that's it. Like, so our given like no matter what and i and i tell our coaches this that we train is like check your ego at the door we believe you we we embrace your story we embrace you know your experience is 100 percent the truth it's how in the world would i ever know what's going on with an individual more than they would right and and yet so many people go in and they see a practitioner and they're told that their feelings are wrong or their experience is wrong or what they're experiencing is ever real it's really hard and, and to your point about diets right i mean even but foundationally, we have 18 different nutrition programs that all of our individuals are exposed to because there is not a one size fits all in a complex body. And also we have different needs at different times. And right. I- the body changes. I mean, it's talk about menopause, right? Like we have to roll right. another world. And like you made a point earlier, and I don't know if it was before we started about how doctors don't always, Western doctors don't always know to, and I'm saying this just because I live in an Eastern and Western world. Right. Um, to, to, to factor things like hormones into why you might be having heart issues. Right. We, or, we learned this systems by or, or silo, you know, we started to specialize in medicine and we forgot how important a generalist is, right? A person that understands. But guess what? The generalist is you. You know, you're the one that understands yeah. all, all aspects or at least has some experience or the most expression of that. Um, so, so we have this community where you know, people feel like it's a super space, safe space to talk about everything. And I mean, during the pandemic, we talked about everything and we, and we continue to do that. I continue to be committed to do that, be, doing that because in my clinical practice, you know, I have people that have uh, very strong religious beliefs. I have people that have very strong um, philosophical beliefs. And I just am so proud of them for embracing, embracing any of it, any and all of it. Right. And it's not my position to come in and say, you know, oh, they're wrong. This is actually right. I, I don't know who the heck I would think I was if I that ever came out of my mouth. Um, but I think that the biggest thing is that we learn through story. And the biggest thing that we learn through is people having the the courage, I guess I would say, to share their worlds and, and their experiences. I When I'm listening to kind of this toolbox, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this would be so good for all of our coaches to have, you know, um, in their repertoire, their verbiage, but also in our community. So I'll make sure that we we post for everybody um, impactfulfund.org so that they can go and look at the creative coping toolkit. Um, I'd love to have you you back where maybe we can pull some of those tools and, and go kind of deeper into those. But we we I guess I'll say this. People have asked me a lot um, why I don't hide it why I tell everybody everything right why I talk about you know when my hair started falling out and I developed a product to help for hair growth because I just was traumatized by it right I mean like handfuls and um when my platelets have gone off from an immune perspective what I'm having or struggling with fear of the flare after coming off a flight or, or things like that but I think the biggest thing is is that when we create our reality through storytelling there's a holistic aspect of all both the spirit and the emotionality of the story and the factual aspect of the story, right? And I, I think I, I love that you're giving people kind of that marriage of, of the practical tools that they can go out through story though and, and through the mouth of babes. Like you said, a lot of kids in their innocence or also maybe they haven't had the life experience where they've been shut down, right, for, for telling their truth in a vulnerable in a vulnerable way. Um, tell me about your upcoming projects. Well, Health One Hundred and One 
course, which is sleep, nutrition, movement, mindfulness and stress, and human sexuality education. Okay, hey, start start when you start from the beginning. Cause I'm gonna I want to talk about all of I want to touch base. So so number one was uh, sleep. <laughs> I love the S word, sleep. I really believe that if we could and and there's you know if we could master sleep and nutrition, we would probably you know have seventy plus percent of all diseases gone. That's my opinion. Okay, second one was what? Nutrition. Love it. And nutrition, guys, is like nutrition, nutrients, right? It's not not eating. It's, it's right. um, yeah, I mean, it's just. Well, I think it's important to understand the, the connection between the gut and the mind. Absolutely. So funny enough, um, my son, Eland, who's now 20, going to be 26, I have a really cool, I was teaching a course, um, gosh, I, I think it was a, a cardiology department. I was teaching a course that was very pregnant. And I was talking about the gut microbiome and the gut brain connection 26 years ago. So I am a diehard. Um, You're way ahead of the time. Well, you know, I think you learn a lot when you go through a lot. I guess I'll say that. I was never, with my particular autoimmune disorder, pregnancy was not an option. So as I was very pregnant teaching that course, um, you know, I, I had a, a significant conviction on why it was so important because it saved my life and it also allowed me to bear two children and create new lives in this little earth we call, this little place we call earth. So, okay, number three is? Uh, movement. Movement. I love that you don't use the word exercise. Yeah, that just I, work. I know. I love exercise. I'm not putting down exercise, but I, I like when I'm done. <laughs> Ooh, I love that. Exercise is good when you're finished. Um, movement, critically important. And, and you know, we sometimes have individuals that have what they call post-exertional malaise, which is when their disease state or their level of oxygen depletion or dysautonomia, they can't regulate the blood pressure, happens during exercise. And so movement sometimes, even passive movement, we have individuals that when we're working towards our their healing journey and we're, we're getting them in the right trajectory, acupuncture and massage is considered uh, movement in in the fast metabolism diet phase three massage is considered an exercise um, so that passive movement the movement of chi the movement of blood the movement of lymphatics the movement of acidity in the body is is so important I love that you use the word movement. even stretching I think people underestimate the importance of stretching one of my favorite yoga moves is happy baby because I feel like when you are rolling around on your back, uh, your lungs go so far down in the back that it actually, I feel like it's almost like a lung massage. So for anyone who has any kind of respiratory thing, the fact that you can almost feel like you're giving a little stimulation to the to the, to the lungs is amazing to me. And, and I feel like, oh, I can take deeper breaths. I'm actually creating some circulation there and um, I love pushing out use, toxins. And I love that you use that pose. I have a client both that had COPD and dermatomyositis with pulmonary uh, fibrotic tissue. And there was we were trying to improve their PFTs, their pulmonary functions, right? So it's not like, I think it makes you feel better. It's like, look, guys, I mean, I'm a, I got to have a protocol for progress. I got to, you know, check them in at Brigham next week and see what the heck's going on. And we did so much of that. A physical therapist actually told me um, I, you know, I'm always reaching out to people like yourselves to say, help, you know, I need help with this person. I need insight. I need wisdom. I need more than I could possibly um, get out in the world and experience myself to bring back to the table. And that is a pose that, yes, it made a significant impact in PFTs and both a client with COPD. And uh, well, it's sort of interesting, you know, part of my pitch when I reach out to the top people, whether it's at Stanford or Anna Freud Institute in England or Thrive Australia, Healthy Minds in Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin, like all the various incredible experts. And I should talk to you when I get back into, um, when I do some of my pieces in Health 101, is um, being able to take all of this incredible knowledge and boil it down into just easy to consume, uh, information for the just the basic person living in the world who may not always have a lot of money, all the best insurance, the ability to even navigate how to go about getting access to some of the best vetted information. 
when you're overwhelmed with all these things you can do on TikTok and Instagram and, you know, word of mouth where you're not, again, we're not talking to like medical professionals. We're just, you know, surviving. Yeah, absolutely. And, but, but it's, I love this dissemination of knowledge, right? And, and I always tell people like feel, fitting what's right for you. I've gotten horrible advice from people from Stanford and I've gotten the best advice yeah. in the world from people at Stanford. Right. A, a pedigree just depends not, on you. Yeah, right? it depends. Yeah, it depends. Yeah. It depends. And also like a, a, like nobody has a hierarchy over you. Right. In this whole journey. Yeah. I mean, you know, but but knowledge and like what fits for you and and, you know, seeking knowledge and seeking knowledge and seeking knowledge. Give me number four. You went through those really fast, but I'm about oh, uh, human sexuality education. OK. And and I, I feel like I'm missing one. We have oh, stress and mindfulness. mindfulness. Ah, stress and mindfulness. Love it. Um, stress and mindfulness. Um, and I love that you use the word mindfulness. Um, so many times people will be commissioned with or charged with uh, relieving their stress by eliminating things. And sometimes they just can't. Um, the season, certain seasons of people's lives are more stressful than others. You know, I couldn't change that my dad passed away. I couldn't change some of the things that were going on in our family. And, and you know, just changing the stress is was not or the an option, changing those peripheral things. But the way in which I reacted and responded, I could make effort for that, but also how I infused my body to be more resilient under those kinds of conditions was, it's like I, someone said to me, and it was talking about hurricanes in Florida, right? When we rebuild, we rebuild stronger by learning what took us down and putting in tools, mortar, brick, whatever it is that made us more resilient for the next storm so that we can stand in all our glory and all our beauty and weather the storm. And I just loved that analogy post uh, hurricane, <laughs> um, but it, but I thought about if we just embrace that in our bodies, right? Like, how do we build back stronger? You know, yeah. because, because there's going to be a storm and a next storm and a next storm. Um, and how are we protective? I, I interviewed an individual uh, uh, last week that really talked about you know protecting, being mindful of who's in your environment, what's in your environment, and what you're exposed to. Yeah. We talk a lot about that from a toxin perspective, but also in a nutrition perspective. I go, when you open your mouth, it is going to do one of two things. It's going to make you healthier or it's going to push you towards lack of health. That's it. There's no benign food. It's because it engages and interacts with us. Um, so so I love in the in the basic teachings. I, I just, I mean, I, I guess maybe I'm I'm excited about the 101, 101, 101 perspective because I like that if we focus on sleep, if we focus on nutrition, if we focus on me- movement, um, human sexuality and stress and mindfulness, imagine the change, the difference in our population's health if we just focused on that. And I think sometimes we try to think of this magic bullet or magic pill or magic idea or magic movement, <laughs> any of it, um, for a dynamic, a dynamic body. And so in this, in this initiative, what is the ultimate goal? Um, is to educate people about everything you just mentioned, um, through story so that, and, and I film a lot of people and then we weave it all together. It's kind of like micro stories. It's not like you're following one or two, three people through their journey. It is like being at a cocktail party or a dinner party. And you're talking mm-hmm. to a bunch of really interesting people who are being really vulnerable and sharing something that they went through and how they navigated it and how where they are now with it. And then we 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 sprinkle in experts who then kind of break it down in the brain science component. So it's what we've learned is that when a five-year-old knows what the prefrontal cortex is and how to move the energy from the amygdala to the prefrontal cortex and can list off the, like within a minute, two or three different ways to do that. And now they're like educating their parents, but it, it's a community thing. Like we all have to be involved. It can't just be the kids. It has to be the parents too. 
And it's a practice. It's something that we all need to work on. So we have a lot of activities, a lot of brain hacks, a lot of ways to just have fun with it. Um, I love what you just said, because um, one of the things is I we, it seems like individuals, it's it's OK for people to be knowledge seekers, but it's not OK oftentimes for adults to be help seekers. Right. Like I need help with this. I need how I, like I said, with with my friends and, and myself that have struggled at times, how do I receive help? Kids are hardwired to ask for help. Will you help me cut this? Will you help me open this? Will you help me? They're still they're still in the belief system. They're still in the belief system that until they're not. Until they're not. Yeah. In 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 hopefully they're still, you know, as they start to identify themselves as autonomous, right? I think sometimes that can become that's why the teenage years can be or adolescents can be so angst for so many kids is autonomy sometimes is correlated with lonely or alone, right? You're alone in your decision, you're alone in your struggle. But I think that that if we can start to teach our children how to receive help, how to have knowledge and 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 how to make a change. Like I love that you're empowering them physiologically how to make a change in their body for the better. I think that's that's amazing. And my goodness, we don't give them enough credit for what they can absorb. I mean it's if we just taught, right, some of this basic but profound, impactful things, um, they can change the generation of our health, I believe. I I'm believe. from believer. I started all of this to be an advocate for kids. Turns out now I'm more an advocate for grown-ups. The inner, the inner <laughs> child. For health. It feels like the inner child, right? Like maybe we needed this when we were little and we didn't get it. And I love yeah, I mean, I think when a parent, I, I, I don't know why, because my parents were far from perfect. Like I, they were young and dumb when they got married. You know, I, I spent my first couple of months sleeping in a drawer. Like, you know, they weren't prepared. <laughs> I didn't necessarily, I think because they were uh, ill-prepared to have a kid and they made their the best, they did the best they could and they did a fine job. I feel, I felt like when I started having kids, I needed to be not perfect because I know that doesn't exist. But I felt like I needed to have all the answers or they wouldn't feel safe. And then that would like hurt their childhood. Right. But when I felt like I always had to have all the answers. I felt like I always had to go in and I lived with a cape on. Rescue and fix. Rescue and fix. So I didn't really get to teach them that they are fully capable of making decisions. I catastrophized everything. Right. Oh, be careful. Nothing is good happens after midnight. There's drunk drivers. Watch out for this. Watch out for that. I would send them out the door with all this fear on top of their own apprehension or anxiety. And so I learned in making all these films that I thought, holy cow, <laughs> I wish that I had had that I have a do over. Yeah. Right. I would have just dealt with things very differently. And now it took me years to learn to sit with another human being and their stuff, not try to fix them. Right. And that took a while. Now my kids think something's wrong with me because I'm not <laughs> trying to fix them. But it is so much more empowering for the person you do really want to help to listen to them right and believe that takes practice and believe and, and yeah. figure it out together I, I, everybody's different i think every healthcare practitioner every person that's going to engage with a person that walks in feeling vulnerable and talking about their health experience needs this i really do um we're lucky at the institute where i where i'm at i'm very fortunate that you know all of this is embraced and 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 embodied and supported and, I, and it's not because they thought it would be a cool idea. Quite frankly, it's because we get the sickest of the sick, right? It takes, they say, you know, 10 years and 20 doctors before somebody lands in the clinic at the Institute, unfortunately, and they've usually been through a lot. And so the only way to unravel a complex issue is to incorporate these types of things. So so it's it's a rarity, I, unfortunately, in medicine, but it's I really feel really fortunate um, Sheila, can I, I know my community is going to have tons of questions. Can I ask if you would be willing to come back? Um, they usually post tons of questions. I'll get everybody yeah. to, to impactfulfund.org. Look at the creative coping toolkit. But well, and also they can go to impactful.co, not okay. com, but co. Impactful.co okay. is where that's the sort of like corporation that distributes it globally. Um, I am working, and I think I mentioned this before, working on setting it up so that people who have a who are card carrying members of the public library will be able to access it for at seven days increment seven day increments for free um, 
not live yet. We're working on it. It may be live by January or maybe this fall. Um, but my goal is to get it out in a meaningful way where people can access these this content in a safe way. I mean, well, I was I we I live in a community in Colorado in Castle Rock, and we just built a brand new public library. And I think in this day and age of TikTok and you know Instagram, and it just and yeah. it's such a beautiful building. And um, what, some of my favorite things we talk about individuals, they say, got your book at the library. It just just warms my heart. It makes me so happy. And I think it's such a cool thing. So I, I thank you for putting it in that kind of a, a venue because it makes it accessible to anybody. And I think the the 101 concept, but all of the different micro issues that that you're giving a skill set for, I think is really going to help. So Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. I know you're crazy busy. I love the storytelling that goes on. And I know our community is going to love all those, um, I would say, incredibly wise and intuitive comments um, from the kids and their stories that come through. So thank you so much, Sheila, for being with us. Oh, thank you for having me. I would love to have you back. Totally. And we'll have, I'll have even more to share. <laughs> I, I, keep doing what you're doing we need it and thank you so much for being on we'll talk soon all right thank you <laughs> <laughs>